All right. Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to today's webinar on decarbonization. Uh, I'm Carrie Garcia, the statewide local government energy efficiency best practices coordinator, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Uh, so just a quick overview of kind of the agenda that we have here. Uh, basically, I'm just going to run through, um, as I always do, the statewide energy efficiency collaborative. Uh, just for those of you who may not be familiar with the program, and go over some uh, basic webinar logistics, um, and then we'll go to our our featured presentation with Sean Armstrong, and so um, you know what I what we kind of came up with today is just do a, a, a decarbonization one on one. You know, answer the what, why's, and the how uh, for decarbonization. Um, and so um, to get into the Energy Efficiency Collaborative and my role as a coordinator. Um, so in the statewide Energy Efficiency Strategic Plan, the California Public Utilities Commission called for the creation of a coordinator to facilitate a statewide focus. Um, both in gathering and sharing exemplary policies and practices, and also tracking progress of local government energy efficiency and sustainability progress on a statewide level. So as the coordinator, I work closely with the Statewide Energy Efficiency Collaborative, or SEEK. Um, that is an alliance between three statewide NGOs, ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, the Institute for Local Government, and the Local Government Commission, um, as well as the four California investor-owned utilities. So to Together, we support local governments in their efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and save energy. We do this through a number of different resources and services, such as ICLE's Clear Path Tools, ILG's Beacon Recognition Program, LGC's Annual Seek Forum, and various workshops, uh, webinars, fact sheets, and guides. So once again, all these resources are available to local governments at no cost uh, through Seek. Um, and it should just remind everybody to Seek Forum, um, if you don't already know, it's coming up in June on uh, 20th and 21st here in Sacramento, so registration is currently open, so please check that out when you have time. And before we get started, uh, I want to go over a few logistics. Everyone will be muted except for our panelists. Um, we have a fair amount of participants today, so we'll ask everybody to type your questions into the question box. And uh, feel free to submit those at any time during the webinar. We'll take a few breaks and we'll, we'll answer those as we go along. Um, and so any questions we don't happen to get to, or if you you just have a question that pops into your head after the end of the webinar, um, you just didn't have time to answer it, go ahead and shoot that my way, um, or res basically respond back to the webinar and it'll send it to me. Um, and we will go ahead and follow up um, at the end uh, in a follow-up email, basically. So, um, and as a reminder to everybody, I know I get these questions all the time, I don't mind answering them, but just to let everybody know, this webinar will in fact be recorded. Uh, and I always send out a posting uh, shortly after the webinar so you can find the recording and the PDF file uh, of the presentation. Uh, so now I'm excited to introduce our presenter, Sean Armstrong of Redwood Energy. Um, Sean, uh, I'll give his little bio. He has a great bio. Uh, Sean is one of the leading designers of zero net energy housing in the world uh, with more than 2,300 DE residences built and hundreds more in construction. Sean focuses on the mantra all electric is cheaper to build and solar power is the cheapest electricity for sale. So Sean's career started in 2005 as a development project manager for a top 10 affordable housing developer, where in 2005 to 2006, he led the design of the nation's first apartment complex to provide solar electric power to each meter. And in 2012, the nation's first 100% solar powered apartment. In 2011, Sean co-founded Redwood Energy to provide dedicated d and &E energy modeling construction cost consulting services to other developers throughout North America. This industry leading work has won Sean's company International Design Awards, including the United Nations 2017 World Habitat Grand Prize, the PCBC Gold Nugget 2017 Grand Prize, and the 2015 Housing Innovation Award from the U.S. Department of Energy. So uh, I will leave it at that. I think that's quite uh, a resume here, and I will leave it up to Sean to take the rest of the presentation away. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, testing, can you hear me? Yep, come in. All right. That's fine. Here we go. So um, thank you, Carrie. Good morning, everybody. Uh, the housing that you're looking at here on your screen is this award-winning project. Um, this is what the future looks like. This is all electric apartment complex. Not that necessarily the future looks like apartment complexes, but it is true that since 2008, more than half of all the housing built in California every year has been apartments. So kind of true that this is the future. It's all electric. It's 100% Solar powered. It got the World Habitat Award, as you see in the lower left hand corner. It got the Housing Innovation Award from the Department of Energy. And it really was not a, a bad deal. This was a cost effective, profitable move for the developer to make, which I think is one of the reasons why it gets awards, is because it, it succeeded on all the different levels. 
Um, so next slide, I'm going to take you guys through decarbonization 101, just the, the basics of what's going on out there. Nothing too tricky. So um, let's see if I can get my slide. There we go. Slide to forward. Uh, this is well, you already got a little bit of the bio. So this is just me on the lower left-hand corner, my partner Michael in the lower right-hand corner. In the middle, the picture is the house where we met. <laughs> this is a demonstration home on Humboldt State University's campus. And it's a solar-powered home. It was off-grid at the time that I lived there. And both Michael and I have been involved in solar-powered and wind-powered housing since 1995. So 20, uh, yeah, we're getting into 28 years now. In 23 years, what am I saying? Uh, 23, I can count, I promise. <laughs> um, so lots of experience, and I'd be happy to answer questions as we go along. So uh, what is decarbonizing? These are the, the four biggies that we can deal with, um, I think, as city planners. So on the left hand, upper left, you can see there's efficiency. There's a lot of different uh, places to apply efficiency. LEDs are kind of famous now because Currently, they use one eighth the electricity as the incandescent bulb that makes the same amount of electricity, one eighth or about 12%. But the next generation that comes out in a few years uses 6% of an incandescent bulb, or about, yeah, it's pretty impressive, maybe one sixteenth then of what an incandescent bulb uses. There's also the other kind of efficiency that um, now that we're getting electricity consumption reduced, there's the materials efficiency that starts becoming much larger. As an example, an iPhone will use more energy in its construction than it will in its entire lifetime. It's very front weighted. The day you buy an iPod, it doesn't matter how many times you plug it into the wall, you'll never consume as much electricity as was produced just to make it. This is important as we think about decarbonizing is that there are immediate things we could do about not purchasing things that have high carbon impacts. Um, so it's not just ongoing efficiency, it's the materials and the energy goes into them now. They're, it's both. On the right hand side, you can see Tesla's new semi truck. So electrifying transportation is a fundamental this is you know, 30 to 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions that we produce, depending upon what state you're in. It's huge. So having um, not just the nice cars, the passenger cars, which is the majority, it's about 90% of the transportation greenhouse gases comes from personal cars. And 10% of it about comes from semi trucks going up and down the road. Granted, semis put out a very high particulate smoke that has terrible health consequences. So it's some um, disproportionate unhealthy. In the lower left-hand corner, it's a great example. So uh, offshore wind is the least expensive way to develop wind. And wind, it turns out, is now the least expensive large energy supply out there. But it's almost neck and neck with big solar fields. Depends upon the, like, they have auctions. So the auctions change every few months, but they are right there. Both of those are less expensive than building a natural gas plant or a coal plant or a nuclear plant. It's the least expensive electricity that can be made today. That's the future. Uh, up here, by the way, we have um, in Humboldt County, we have these incredibly strong winds about 20 miles off the coast. And this area, the Navy has said, it's fine. You can put up big wind turbines out in the ocean. So we've already gone through like a bid process and we'll be providing up here in Humboldt County. Um, maybe uh, 100 offshore wind turbines, you know, like a really big field that will power a good chunk of Northern California. Now in Northern California, um, at the French Laundry, this is an image of what decarbonized kitchens look like. If you haven't, I've never eaten at the French Laundry, but it's one of the fanciest restaurants in all of California, arguably in the country, one of the most famous of all restaurants. And, um, about a year ago, it converted completely away from natural gas combustion. Uh, I'll talk about it a little bit more later, but it's done because it's safer, it's faster, it's easier to control, it's better cooking, and luxury cooking all over the world has been converting to induction. So this is, this is kind of what it looks like. Efficiency, renewable energy as a supply, 
uh, switching away from transportation and other end uses of natural gas combustion or just any fossil fuel combustion. Any questions here? All right, I carry, I'm gonna trust you that you'll break in as necessary. Yeah, no questions at the moment, but I'll let you know. Okay, so uh, where this comes from, we have a legal commitment to decarbonizing. Uh, it started back in 2006 with the Global Warming Solutions Act. It's a law, requires that we produce 80% less than the 1990 levels of greenhouse gases by 2050. Oopsie. Uh, it's equivalent though, because we haven't made a whole lot of progress. That's equivalent to 95% less than the 2012 levels. So you can remember a few years ago in 2012, that if you looked around, you would have to reduce, we do need to reduce 95% of what was happening just six years ago. All of it, the transportation, the buildings, the manufacturing, the industry, the airplanes, all of it, 95% less than that is what our goal is. It's consistent with our international goals as well. Um, so in 2015, we signed on to the COP21, and that means that we're trying legally to prevent less than a two degree centigrade increase in global temperatures. Combine these two agreements have a lot of um, successor laws and implementation laws that these are foundational for you to be aware of. This is where it all comes from. And this is where it's going to. This is a big graph. Just take a moment to digest it. So looking up on top, we see energy efficiency is considered to be the number one place that we're going to decarbonize, is just reducing our energy consumption. The next bar below it is the electricity decarbonization, the, the wind turbines and the solar fields uh, and maybe small micro hydro. Next one is called smart growth. Those of you into city planning, you can see that it's really important that we plan cities so that people don't have to transport themselves as much. But it's still not considered a big wedge in the solution. It's a smaller wedge. It's a necessary wedge. The next one, PV roofs, you know, that was estimated to be negligible. This is a 2012 study that was um, produced by Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. It was published in Science Magazine. I have disagreements with it, but I'm um, just letting you know this is some of the best science out there on, on the big picture. You can see biofuels in light blue. That's one of the disagreements I have. I don't think that um, there's a realistic future for biofuels. Uh, I base that upon Southern California gas, for instance, they have found and located a grand total of 4% of their natural gas demand in natural biogas opportunities. Of that, 4% that they think they can power their gas demand, which is using everything in the kitchen sink, all of it. Actually, that 4% is already being used by other people. This is not like natural gas buried in the ground and we better start using it. This is in operation. These are natural gas flares coming off of power, off of sewage treatment plants and landfills that's being captured and used right now. Not all of it, but most of it, there, there's um, really not a business model that says we'll reduce 95% of natural gas consumption in SoCal gas's pipelines, and then we'll put 5% or 4% back in, and we'll just use 4 or 5%, the natural natural gas that's available out there. Um, I've asked people, like, is that possible? Could SoCal gas just sell 5% or 4% of what they're selling now? And the answer is, uh, after bankruptcy, the assumption is, is that um, you know a collapse of 95% of their sales would look like a bankruptcy with a resell of assets. So this is, in order for us to use biofuels, we have to reimagine our gas utilities as these itty bitty tiny little things, providing very small services. That's, I don't think it's realistic. I don't, I don't see natural, natural gas as enough of the supply or a business model that, that sells it. 95% less than what's being sold right now and, and still even bother selling it in the first place. 
So, uh, you know, I look at the red PV roofs and I look at the light blue uh, biofuels and I think, you know, it's probably going to be more PV roofs and there's going to be biofuels. Um, the next one down is, is a big one. And this is the non-energy, non-CO2. And this is an example of we, we burn a lot of natural gas to make cement. When we're out there cultivating the soil, um, when you rake the soil, you kill all the little critters inside of it, you expose it to UV radiation, and you get these huge plumes of methane gas off of farmed land. People think that, oh, it's the cows. Yeah, it's also the cows and the cattle. Um, it, it's both, really. It's this unsustainable land practices and there's unsustainable delivery of food to animals that, that pollute a lot with it. So there's a lot of work to be done there on encouraging people to eat less meat or um, requiring meat farms to be more, more sustainable. Uh, you can see that's a huge, that, that dark green one, that's a huge item. How to deal with farms and how to deal with cement. Cement, you know, you have to dry out rock uh, like 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit in order to turn it into dust chemically and make it like just add water rock. That's a, a big deal to create just add water rock, which is what cement works as. So um, we can power those plants with electricity. I mean, they smelt aluminum with electricity, not with natural gas. Uh, so there's certainly the ability to raise the temperature appropriately to smelt or to bake cement. That's a technical possibility. It's just people aren't doing it much. The last one is electrification. Now, this graph I, is a political graph. It's, this is predicting how all the laws and all the technical opportunities exist. People can disagree on them. I would argue that the yellow, for instance, electrification is gonna be larger than the biofuels. It's gonna take up almost all the biofuels. There's not gonna be a biofuel opportunity except maybe for flying airplanes. Everything else can be done with electricity. It's, um, it's really only when you need really dense energy storage and gasoline is very energy dense so that you can then fly it through the sky you know, have like a, a gas battery essentially in an airplane. That's why gas is so awesome. It's so energy dense and lightweight. Um, so it's not, right now I haven't seen a whole lot of opportunities for electric airplanes, you know, battery powered electric airplanes, but they make them, they're just really small. But that, that's pretty much the last place where you have to have something like gasoline is flying. You're just too far away from an, an electric plug. <laughs> Let's see, and I see a question here of, Sean, can you explain why PV roofs is different than electricity decarbonization? Yeah, so I, I see them saying electricity decarbonization is happening at the utility scale and rooftop PV is happening at the residential scale. And I agree, those should not be different. They're, it's the same thing. You're either converting the electricity to renewables at the grid scale or at the residential scale, but it's the same solar panels, it's the same electricity. And um, yeah, same thing, you're right. So uh, that sort of captures what a big picture is, maybe the best big picture that's been created so far of how we'll get there. And then I'm just gonna walk you through a few of those line items of, of what that practically looks like. And you know, maybe how it's relevant to you in your county or your city or your organization. So first, I'd like to talk about how decarbonized energy in the grid is being driven by low costs over politics. We might think in California that our progressive generally politics um, or our renewable energy oriented laws are having this significant impact, which they are. But you can see that in North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Kansas, Oklahoma, even states like Texas, you know, the great oil state of Texas, they have deep penetration now of wind power because it's cheap. Uh, these are states that are frequently, um, while they might have a Republican governor, the 
their power supply is purchased by a rural electric co-op that's democratically controlled, about 70% of our country, the land mass, not the people. 70% of the land mass is serviced by a rural electric co-op, 70%. A rural electric co-op looks a lot like what we have in California called community choice aggregation or community choice energy. These little micro utilities essentially set up like a Sonoma Clean Power, Marin Clean Energy. These are um, small utilities that purchase electricity on behalf of the people locally and it's an elected democratically controlled organization that's a derivative of the local government. That's how things are in most of the country. And as a consequence, normal business-minded people go out there looking for the least cost energy. That's the job of a rural electric co-op is to save the members money. In that environment, very practical, apolitical, you see people adopting wind turbines in parts of the country that are really windy and making more than 30% of their energy now from wind turbines. Um, and it's not political. I put on the right hand side the 2016 presidential electoral map so you can compare and say like, oh, really, like wind turbines are happening in places that are, are deeply Republican and maybe you associate Republicans with being uh, against renewable energy. And I just want to help you open that up and say it's not true. Uh, national politics are not the same as local politics, as you probably well know. So last year's news in California, last year's news, is that right about today, May 16th, we were able to serve 42% of electricity demand with renewable energy. This year today, it's kind of cloudy and rainy here, would be closer to say 47%, maybe closer to 50%. Um, we're putting in solar fields all over the state and big wind turbines. And there hasn't been a natural gas plant approved for California in a year and a half now. It is it looks like our state has turned the corner where we are no longer approving new natural gas plants. We're no longer approving new natural gas pipelines. Just last month, the Public Utilities Commission turned down, turned down a half a billion dollar natural gas pipeline connecting San Diego and LA. Uh, both those areas are controlled by the utility SoCal Gas. San Diego Gas and Electric is owned by the same utility that owns SoCal Gas, Sempra. So this is one utility connecting up to themselves. And that got turned down. The judge at the Public Utilities Commission said, please find a less expensive solution. I wanna just draw people's attention back to that, that electric grid is exceeding our legal mandates due to low cost. Not political. Whenever you're going in front of your city council, I know that every city council has got a, a spectrum of politics. Every single person up there understands low cost. And that for me has been my place of success is that even though I do have a long hair, like it literally goes down to the bottom of my back and I am uh, an avowed liberal, all that kind of stuff. I hang out with um, very mercenary business oriented developers who are delighted to find a lower cost way to build. And they're totally cool with the fact that it's electric. They're cool with the fact that it's got solar panels up on the roof. They were just looking for a less expensive way to build and to own. And that's the least expensive way to build and own. Build it all electric, put solar panels up on the roof. That's your highest profitable, lowest cost move um, over, say, like six years or so. So that's why we're here today. The laws, absolutely. But we're going faster than the laws now because of the, the low cost of renewable energy. So to Carrie's question before, um, this year's news, just a few, like last week on Wednesday, a week ago, the Energy Commission announced um, the long anticipated plan that we're going to be building in 2020 solar powered homes. They're not 100% solar powered. Imagine if you will, uh, a zero to 100 scale in 2005, that's 100. That home built in 2005 is at the 100 part on the scale. And we've been going down ever since then. The 2016 code is maybe a 55 or so, 54 on that scale. 
That's what a code compliant house would be on the zero to 100. And the 2020 code is going to be a 46 in its energy consumption, its efficiency. At 46, you get an efficiency based building permit, but you're not done. You have to put solar on to get you down to a 26. At 26, you're allowed to get a building permit. You can get to 26 either with more and more efficiency, but it's hard to get below 46. You can. Um, but you have to get to 26 to get your building permit. Below 26 is, is still energy. It's still going to have a utility bill. It's, it's supposed to be zero net electric. The idea being that a home generally has gas and electricity delivered currently, and therefore they're going to offset the electric side of the load down to 26. And the other 26 is assumed to be gas. It can't be offset. <clears throat> One of the interesting things about this code process is that because they assumed gas was there, they stopped at a 26. But for cost effectiveness purposes, it's like to benefit the home buyers, to benefit the banks who rely upon people who have the ability to pay their mortgages, to benefit people financially, they would have chosen an all electric code that was 100% solar powered. They did the analysis, they said that is more cost effective than what we're proposing but they didn't feel like they had the political ability to say uh, gas is too expensive. We're going to no longer support gas in the code. It's true, it is too expensive. It is not as inexpensive as all electric. And the state's laws, specifically the Warren Alquist Act that authorizes the Energy Commission to put out new energy codes. That 1974 law initiated by Ronald Reagan that requires cost effectiveness upgrades to the energy code. Um, that would have supported all electric 100% solar powered, but they, they couldn't pull that off yet. But that's true. It would have been cheaper for everybody. So you can see here in the decarbonization, we're decarbonizing the energy, we're adding decarbonized energy in our own homes as a part of that. Any questions here? I know some people have been a little bit uh, confused about what this new code might mean. Okay, I'll continue on. Importantly, the 2020 solar code, as I'm calling it, uh, it's not a zero net energy code, but it is a solar code, uh, will also support electrification of residences. Uh, and the 2016 code, the one we're, on, one we're on now, there isn't an explicit pathway for an all electric home. It's called prescriptive, meaning just a list of things to do and then you get your building permit. Uh, they, there was, <clears throat> the 2016 code is the first time ever that there wasn't a way to electrify a building. It was a real step backward. And they fixed that in the 2019 code by making even more ways to do it. Um, as an example, on the lower left-hand corner, that's what it looks like to have a water heater that's electric but efficient. As it's called a heat pump water heater. And on top of the tank, you can see that little dark blue box kind of on it. That's a, a little tiny air conditioner. Um, that little tiny air conditioner, like imagine a PTAC, one of those things you see in a window, like a window rattler air conditioner. It's a compressor about that big, but quiet, that sits on top of the tank. And it, and it does cool the air. This is like a little air conditioner there. But in cooling the air, it heats the water. The, the coolness heats the refrigerant. That's what a compressor does. So it's a water heater that's paired kind of with a small air conditioner. <laughs> and that way, if you use one unit of electricity, you get about, about four units of heat energy out. It's a one to four ratio because you gather it from the air. I hope you can't hear my telephone in the background, I apologize. On the right hand side is what you're familiar with. That is an on-demand gas water heater. These two are now on a pathway, gas versus electric. Um, as I've already explained, the electric device will be less expensive to, and I'll go into a little more detail, but this is an important thing about the 2020 code is that it does make all electric available and extra compliant. Now there's a question on the side, I'll pause and address. It says, what do you think about the social cost of carbon versus the cost effectiveness method that the Energy Commission uses now. 
The Energy Commission has currently a cost adder for um, the social cost of carbon. And it's hard for me to understand how any cost could be high enough for a, a global crisis of this sort. I appreciate the cost adder, <laughs> but it's like $12 a ton or something. And, and we're going to lose entire nations um, that are going to go underwater. And there's, you know, there's cities on these small little island nations. They're real people. Um, so my thinking is that the social adder is not enough. But in my experience, the way that things are really changing out there in the development world is that the first cost of lower of, of all electric construction is how things get done. Almost no developer even understand how the Energy Commission tries to rank things. They don't even try to keep up because it changes every three years and they just don't get it. So in terms of what I, I see is what affects change in the world, it's the fact that it's cheaper to build all electric. And regardless of whether or not they add the social cost of carbon to it or not, it, the only place it'd probably make a real difference is if they added it to the electricity bill, which they do a tiny bit. But um, yeah, I think that moving it out of policy and moving it straight into people's pocketbooks is the way that, that the ch changes happen, which is the emphasis of this talk, by the way. So I'm going to go to the next slide. To emphasize this, electrification of buildings is nonpartisan because it is less expensive to build. I'll get into that a little bit more, but look at this map. Isn't this amazing? The propane Energy Research Council, sorry, Propane Education and Research Council. They commissioned this study by a big company, ICF International, very reputable research company. And they made this killer map, among others, showing that since 2010, almost everywhere in the country, the market has shifted to building all electric buildings. That's different from saying that the majority is being built that way. That's not the case, I'll show you in a moment. But the shift, growth. Almost everywhere the growth is seen in all electric. In California on the left hand side you can see most of our counties have also made that shift. In red you can see that some of our most rural areas went to wood and we still have some pockets of natural gas gaining market share, um, specifically SoCal gas territory around Los Angeles. But as soon as you leave that area um, cost effectiveness arguments start to really kick in. In the upper right hand corner, you can see again the 2016 electoral map. And you can see so clearly that um, this is, is happening everywhere. It's happening everywhere because it's less expensive. To sort of show uh, this in a little bit more granular detail, electrified buildings now are 25% of all new homes in the country. This is led by the South because um, four in 10 homes are built in the South. So whatever happens in the South has a dramatic effect on the whole country's um, efforts. So on the right-hand side, you can see in the South that they're now almost at one in two homes are built all electric. Now, where we are in the West, you can see very little movement. And in the Midwest, there's been slow growth. And in the Northeast, almost no growth. But overall on the left-hand side, you can see on the United States side, one in four homes and one in two homes in the South. Uh, to briefly explain why is it different in different parts of the country? The reason is heat pumps. The, the reversible air conditioner that is a heat pump, they used to make air conditioners that just cooled the house. Now they can make a reversible air conditioner that heats and cools the house. It's the same product. It just has a reversible pump. Heat pumps didn't used to work well below 35 degrees Fahrenheit. So in cold parts of our country, people didn't want to use electric resistance in the wintertime when their heat pumps kind of put it out or, or stopped working. Um, but that changed in 2010. That's when the technological innovation switched. And now they're putting heat pumps above the Arctic Circle and they're working them all winter long because they work to negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit now. They used to only work to 30 
85 degrees Fahrenheit, but they've added like 60 degrees Fahrenheit of capacity to them. And now they work everywhere. And since they're cheaper to install and they're cheaper to operate, it's catching on in other parts of our country, but it's been a little bit slow. The, it's only been since 2010, really, that it was that realistic to put in heat pumps other than the south, where it was warm at night, even in the winter. All right, so you understand where it's happening and why. Next slide. Um, so why is all electric growing? Here's an example of why. Uh, HVAC equipment, the heating and ventilation and air conditioning, HVAC, just costs less to buy all electric. On top, you can see that's an air, a heat pump and there's the little fan coil box next to it. So the compressor heat pump sends hot or cold refrigerant to that metal box. And there's a fan there that blows over the metal that uh, the refrigerant essentially is in a little coil, blows over it and that's how you get hot and cold air. That's how your air conditioner works and now it's just a reversible air conditioner. On the bottom, that's if you take the exact same heat pump and make it not a heat pump, make it just an air conditioner. So now that compressor looks identical, is identical in all other ways, but it's just an air conditioner now. And you can see the gas burning box, the square one. That's a separate new thing. And then you still have that same fan coil box. But it's $1,000 more money. It's not a little bit more. It's 50% more expensive. And this is how it is with Goodman. This is how, you know, go, go, go pick a manufacturer and you'll find that the air conditioner is, air conditioner and furnace are more expensive by a significant amount than just making a reversible air conditioner. You can imagine why. I mean, the reversible air conditioner just takes a reversible pump and one extra valve. That's it. It's really cheap, maybe like an extra hundred bucks to the, the product. Whereas adding a gas burning box is a whole other thing and it adds a thousand dollars to it. So that encapsulates this larger thing that you'll you see over and over. Um, gas appliances cost more than all electric equivalents. Hmm. Now, this is a fun one. It'll take a little moment to interpret. So on the top is the electric water heaters. On the bottom is the gas water heaters. What I want to focus your attention on is the annual cost of operation. On the bottom of each of these, you'll see an electric resistance tank in the upper left. Over a year, according to the DOE, this, this is yellow tag information, those yellow tags that you see on appliances that tell you how much they cost in a year according to average gas and electric prices. So this is a nice, consistent federal average perspective. So electric tanks are expensive at $400 plus, $600. But the heat pump version, see that's $114 in a year to operate. And that's a 50 gallon heat pump. If you go to an 80 gallon heat pump, they say it costs about twice that much, 218. But the 50 gallon is what most people would use. If you go to the bottom, instead of it being $114 for your 50 gallon tank, you're gonna see uh, the second one over, that's a 50 gallon tank, that's $213. It's uh, another 50 gallon tank, it's $216. The non-condensing tankless, 236. Concentric vent tankless, 230. Condensing tankless, 202. This is everything A.O. Smith has. They don't have a product that's gas that is as expensive, inexpensive as their heat pump at all. $114 a year that is the least expensive way to get water hot by like half compared to all the other gas products. And that's reality. Efficient electric appliances cost less to operate than efficient gas appliances. People used to say gas was cheaper. They just sort of threw it out there like it was, you know, like the sun comes up every morning and gas is cheaper. Um, that's not the case. Uh, the efficiency that's available with heat pumps has driven the price of operation down to potentially half of what it costs to do efficient gas. That's the reality. So new world that we live in means it's cheaper to install all electric and it's cheaper to operate all electric. And builders don't build for people's utility bills. Just to be really clear, 
um, I'm going to go back to this map where you see how builders, developers all over the country are building all electric. They follow a minimum building code. That's it. Once they pass that energy code, they've done what they're supposed to do to take care of the owners, utility bills. So they're not building to try to find ways to save tenants or owners money on their utility bills. It's not how most homes are built. They're built because it's less expensive for the developer to build in a particular way or more profitable. So this slide here showing how the water heaters are less expensive to operate. This might be useful for um, government agencies who are trying to take care of low-income tenants or make the argument for people to fuel switch their, sorry, their appliances. This makes sense for existing homes, but developers are not that clientele. Developers care about first cost. And uh, yeah, and first cost is still cheaper all electric. Let me uh, show this again clearly. Uh, why is electrification growing? Because in the walls, every time you run gas to a gas appliance, it always costs about 500 bucks per appliance. There's usually four in a home the dryer, the water heater, the furnace, um, and, and water heater, dryer, furnace, I'm forgetting one. But anyway, uh, there's four of them, and it takes about $2,000. So if you have the, the ability, and you always run electricity to every appliance, just to be clear, there's always an electrical line to an on-demand gas water heater or to a dryer or to the cook stove. <laughs> that was the fourth one. Uh, Gas stoves have electricity now. They have electric ignition. So if you have to run electric wire to every single one of these gas burning appliances in new construction, then running the additional gas infrastructure is just that. It's just an extra add-on cost. If you don't have to do that, and it can save you, you a couple thousand dollars, um, a couple thousand dollars can buy a lot of six packs of beer. A couple thousand dollars can like, if you were to put it into things that other people care about, um, it's a lot of money and it changes the way that people make decisions. Let's see here. Um, oh, I see a question here. Can you tell us what the first costs are for each of these products? Um, I'm assuming that you're looking at the gas water heaters these ones here. And the first costs are variable, like the electric resistance tanks are in the range of $500 and the heat pump water heaters are about $1,000. Um, On-demand gas water heaters in the range of $900 to $1,500. Um, they're about the same price as a heat pump water heater, give or take. Um, gas, efficient gas, like a, these direct vents, and these things are often in the range of two to four thousand dollars. A tank, a really efficient tank, can be four thousand dollars for a condensing boiler. Uh, similarly, for a condensing tankless, you might be in the range of three thousand to four thousand dollars for one of those. They're very expensive compared to a heat pump that gets you far more efficiency. So that's an argument. Like if you're looking for a high performance home, which is what you need to do in order to, to get a building permit in California. If you're looking for a high performance home, it's going to be a lot cheaper to buy and install a heat pump water heater than it is, um, say, a 95% efficient condensing tankless. And by a lot, I mean like by thousands of dollars. It's absolutely a, um, a first cost that makes a difference. If you're comparing an old gas tank, which is not legal to install anymore, like you can't put in a 60% efficient gas tank like most of us have in our homes or had. It's not legit, not for new construction. Um, those are cheap, but they're just not legal <laughs> and they're not efficient. Um, oh, and to be fair, an electric resistance tank is cheaper, just a straight out inefficient electric resistance tank is cheaper than a, an inefficient gas tank but the gas tank puts out way more air pollution than the electric resistance tank. It's, it's far more carbon intensive than electric resistance, particularly because our grid is so renewable now. 
and if you solar power your home, even if it's electric resistance, it's still solar powered, it's still decarbonized. But uh, I do encourage people to look at the heat pumps. They're inexpensive and use one fourth the electricity of a straight resistance tank. Um, a question here is in comparing costs, do I consider the maintenance costs? Yes, um, there's very little maintenance on water heaters generally. It's the, yeah, almost none. Uh, someone is asking, what does distillate mean on the map? Oh, I see. Um, distillate in green here. I think this is a wood product. I, um, there's a, and there's also fuel oil, like bunker fuel. Um, I'm, I'm not sure which one that is, if it's like a wood-based or if it's fossil fuel. I apologize for not knowing. It's, it's pretty small out there. Okay, back on track here. We've gone through the gas pricing for home. So my favorite slides here. This is, uh, why is electrification growing? Because electrified cooking is the choice of chefs today. Julia Child, she always cooked on electric resistance. You can see that in the photograph. Every single show that former CIA spy was cooking on electric resistance. But modern style, this is the French laundry in the middle. I mentioned that at the beginning of the, the presentation, you can see this gorgeous new kitchen at the French laundry. Um, if you're in Ventura area, I strongly suggest you go to Cafe Ficelle. Cafe Ficelle is in downtown Ventura. On the right hand side, you can see Jarrett Chambers, the head um, bake chef, bakery chef there. And he loves his induction range in front of him. Uh, he has burn scars all the way up and down his arms, as do most professional chefs. Bad burn scars, like three inch long burn scars, because gas stoves burn at 3,400 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you touch metal that's been heated to 3,400 degrees Fahrenheit, it instantly burns your skin down to like all three layers. You get a second or third degree burn instantly. And you have a scar forever, as he does. Maybe 20 scars he showed me. And he just loved rubbing the top of the induction stove, saying it's so cool. Like even, it, it doesn't produce any heat when it's not in use. It doesn't actually heat the glass per se. It heats the pan that's on it, which will heat the glass. But when you take the pan off, the glass is maybe 400 degrees Fahrenheit, not 3,400, and it doesn't burn you. It's hot, but bakers don't have you know, fingertips barely because they just <laughs> burned them all up anyway. So it's not hot to them. They think it's fantastic and safe. And it doesn't require a hood. It doesn't require nearly as much evacuation of all the pollution out of a stove. So a lot of restaurants that go into older buildings and get retrofitted like them because they don't have to put in expensive ductwork to get rid of the combustion fumes, which are poisonous. Carbon monoxide is poisonous. Formaldehyde is poisonous. These things really hurt you when you inhale them. And induction does none of that. It's a safe, clean, fast, controllable, better cooking experience. So in the lower left-hand corner, you can see Wolfgang Puck. He sells these on his website. He loves induction. You can see Guy Fieri. He's a you know, famous TV personality chef. He pulls out his Sharpie and he always signs his stuff. There's his, I think it's his Viking induction range that he has there. Anthony Bourdain teaching other chef how to cook on induction. He loves induction. If you go to any professional cooking school, you're going to be taught on induction. They have, most cooking schools have abandoned gas and have moved towards induction. It's cheaper even for the school to build. Think of it that way. That's what they're trying to do is like, this is the modern way. It is more controllable. It's faster. It's a safer, it's just better cooking. All these great chefs agree. So where are we going? These are cool projects. Um, in the left-hand corner, you can see a 12-story tall PV array on the wall of that building. In the right-hand side upper, that's a 10-story tall tower that's gonna have PV on the carport wall, like the parking structure. This is actually on the Washington DC Beltway. It's uh, gonna be the first zero net energy apartment complex in Washington DC. 10 stories viewed by 250,000 people driving by in the Beltway every day. 
very excited just about the statement it'll make in our nation's capital to do 100% all electric solar powered low income housing for seniors. Um, in the lower right hand corner, you can see a five story tall building that is going up in San Jose that will be all electric and 100% solar powered. It's for low income families. The lower left hand corner, these are tiny homes for um, homeless veterans in Santa Rosa. And that just got approved and funded. And these little 280 square foot homes, uh, it's saving them thousands of dollars per, per little home to not put in gas. And it also helped make the pill go down for the board of supervisors because homeless housing is rarely popular. They like that it was zero energy. This is where we are going forward. All, all electric is a superior, superior way to build and solar power is our cheapest energy out there now on the grid. And this is the way developers all across our country are moving, big and small, because um, it makes sense for the reasons I've explained. This is the last slide. What can you do? How can you create policy to support California's decarbonization laws? So the first thing, this is the easiest one, and it's a great idea. Provide single induction ranges at lending libraries. Get people experienced. Uh, Sonoma Clean Power is doing this to support early adopters. And they've put, put out 30, I think, single burner induction ranges in this local public libraries, as well as at their office. And they are in hot demand. They're checked out all the time. People love them. You know, it is really easy to put one burner or two burners next, next to your gas stove and transition naturally. Just say, like, do I like this? And that's what I did. And I have been cooking on gas my whole life. I'm a professional chef. I did that for years. And I immediately liked cooking on induction more. It was faster and easier and safer. It was totally real. It was a more pleasurable cooking experience. And that's just what people need. They need to experience it, like get inside of a Tesla car, step on the gas pedal and you know get three Gs of force squishing you into the chair. Use an induction range. It's awesome. Just make it cheap and easy for people to get over the hump of, of fear and worry. The second thing is provide more electric car charging stations. This is hugely important for the convenience of, of being an electric car, which we recognize as shorter distances that they can go. So the more we can provide infrastructure, the faster we'll accelerate the conversion of our number one in California, number one source of carbon is our transportation. And of that, 90% of it is our personal cars. So you could argue that this is the most important thing that you could do. The third one is to provide incentives um, or adopt electrification ordinances that phase out natural gas in all buildings. And you're seeing other forward thinking organizations that have the same laws that we have, COP21, you know, climate change by 2050 laws, and the Netherlands being the leaders in this. And so they have already set up subsidies for Amsterdam homeowners who were gonna stop using natural gas, pay them to stop. And they've been, um, they've made it formal policy. There are no more gas connections possible for new Dutch houses. They've done this, I think, with the first 20 subdivisions or large developments that have been approved. And it's going from uh, policy to law. This is the way that the Netherlands is going to build. And they have natural gas resources. They are, in fact, an exporter. But they themselves are trying to stop what's going on. I mean, the government isn't the same as the private companies that own natural gas. The government is responsible for saving us all from climate climate change. <laughs> the natural gas companies are in charge of making more money and that's how they approach it. Amoral and not helping. So that is the conclusion of my slideshow. And I, there's a question here. The question is, Sean, I know someone who loves their induction cooktop, but the electronics have been unreliable and it fails sometimes. It is out of warranty, expensive to fix, does this product need legislation like the required 10-year warranty on electric car batteries to protect consumers and increase uptake? Absolutely. All products that come out, especially ones that are kind of cutting edge, should require a warranty that is useful, not one-year warranties. When heat pump water heaters came out, 
I had installed them into um, a low-income senior project and a low-income homeless project. And it's first generation, and they failed within 18 months. We had almost three-fourths of them break. This is in 2012, and it was the first generation. And it was a great example. Of, and I went to um, Energy Star, and I complained really loudly, really, really loudly about how they were jeopardizing the safety and health and finances of homeless people by not providing warranties. Because if you don't understand this, in a rental apartment complex, the tenants pay the mortgage. The whole thing is built with a loan, and the people who pay the loan is the tenants with their rent. People who quote unquote own an apartment complex don't own it, the bank owns it, and they don't pay the mortgage, the tenants pay the mortgage. And so additional expenses on a building are paid for through rent by tenants. It doesn't come out of an owner's pocket. So yes, absolutely. We should not be putting people in jeopardy and a simple requirement that there be a warranty is the appropriate way. Uh, Energy Star, I think would be the best. Energy Star requires warranties. And so if you put that marketing brand of Energy Star on your appliance, it means that there's a six year to 10 year warranty. There isn't right now an Energy Star standard for electric, for stoves of any type, no such thing. And it's needed. So the, the long answer is yes, we should have warranties for all things. Um, and especially things that are relatively new. But yeah, this unregulated let the buyer beware thing that's going on with stoves is wrong. To um, a corollary with gas stoves is that gas stoves usually don't burn cleanly. Like in the way the electronics can fail on, on electric stoves, gas stoves will pollute your homes more than you think because it is rare that the gas to air mixture is correctly calibrated. And you just plug that gas stove in, right? You don't check to see that it's working correctly. But that's actually our job. We go out and we inspect stoves. Um, every single stove that goes into an apartment complex, we do combustion safety testing on. And yeah, they fail. There's really incomplete combustion. There's methane that's leaking out. There's not the right amount of air that's going in. So you're getting sooty buildup on the bottom of your pans and inside of your lungs. Um, so I, I would just broaden this to say that stoves need attention. Gas stoves are the number one source of pollution in your home. Number one, the gas stove is the worst possible thing. Almost no hoods work, and they are just an open flame of a fossil fuel in your home. Terribly dangerous. So for people's health. Uh, so I do think that stoves should get more attention. Are there other questions? Don't seem to be any more questions coming through, Sean. I think we're just at time, so. We did it. We got one hour yes, in. we did. <laughs> got the slides. Um, well, for any of you all listening, the 31 of you who are left, uh, I really appreciate your attention. You're welcome to reach out to me um, by email. And I'd be happy to do a lunch and learn with your city council or something like that um, if you're trying to get policies moved forward. Let me know how I can help. Awesome. Well, all right. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, Thank it was really you. great for you to join us today. Uh, super informative, and I hope everyone, you know, that's still on the call right now, uh, really found it worthwhile and valuable. So just as a reminder, I'm going to send out a webinar recording and a PDF of today's presentation. Um, so you all get that, and even folks that weren't able to attend, uh, let them know. Like, they'll also get a recording, and this will conclude our webinar for the day. I hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Thank you, Carrie. Appreciate it. All right. Have a good one. Bye, everyone.